Thank you, worship team, for leading us, and thank you all for singing. I have a question I want to begin with today, and normally when I ask questions, I tell you you don't have to respond, but I want you to raise your hand if, this, if you can identify with this. How many of you have ever felt unworthy of something God asked you to do because of things you were struggling with in your life? All right, I don't think everybody's being honest, but I see some hands out there. That's an important question that I want us to wrestle with really each week during this series, but especially this morning as we begin. I've been looking forward to preaching this series because I find the stories of the Old Testament characters to be really fascinating. I appreciate that the Bible presents its characters as three-dimensional figures rather than flat stereotypes. The men and women we read about in the Old Testament are presented as real humans with flaws and weaknesses, but in spite of their shortcomings, God used them to accomplish his purposes. My hope, as we walk through this series, is that we're able to connect with these flawed characters, the flawed nature of the men and women from the Old Testament, and we're able to connect that with our own imperfect lives and recognize that what was true for them remains true for us today. That God is glorified and his purposes are accomplished precisely because he chooses to release his power in flawed people. And I want to camp there for a moment. If God used us and we were perfect, how does that bring glory to God? If all that you're serving him with is the strength of your own gifting and wisdom and knowledge and strength, how does that glorify God? The Apostle Paul says it well in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7, when he says, We have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the power that flows through us comes from God, not from us. As I was talking through this series with our staff, Pastor Cindy Agoncillo referenced a comment that Jackie Peel made as she was speaking to our young adults about Abraham during a series that they were doing focused on Bible characters. And Jackie pointed out that if God desires to work through people, using imperfect people is his only option because we're all flawed. That may sound really simple, but that's a great point. If God chooses to work through us, he doesn't have any choice but to use flawed people because that's every one of us. God's choice to partner with flawed people in Scripture reinforces his desire to work and through us and our lives today. The title Sinners and Saints isn't meant to apply that some of the people we're going to be looking at were sinners and others were saints. Sinners and Saints highlights that the heroes of the Bible, like us, were simultaneously sinners and saints. In his book, which I think many of you have read, I know I've given it out to prayer partners, our staff discussed it, our church board discussed it as well, this book, Praying Like Monks and Living Like Fools, Author Tyler Statton writes this, The New Testament doesn't call the earliest Christ followers Christians. They had another title, saints. Today we tend to reserve that title for the most pious spiritual elite. But in the early church, it was commonplace. The everyday name for the everyday Jesus follower. That's because the biblical use of the word saint has nothing to do with human competence and everything to do with divine grace. To call someone a saint, and this is really important, is not to necessarily call them good. It's only to name them as someone who has experienced the goodness of God. I love that. Calling someone a saint isn't calling them good. It's identifying them as someone who has experienced the goodness of God. And the good news about that is, that's every one of us. Because all of us, need to experience God's goodness and grace. As an example, think about the first century church at Corinth, to whom the Apostle Paul wrote two New Testament letters. The Corinthian church was notorious for its problems. 
including division over which spiritual leader people viewed as worthy of following, participating in the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner. Some would go off in the corner and get drunk while others didn't have enough. Some would gorge themselves on food while the poorer people didn't have any. And then they even um, tolerated blatant sexual immorality in their midst. But despite all their dysfunction, in Paul's introductory letter to them, he writes, to the church of God in Corinth, to those sanctified, and that root word for sanctified means holy, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus and called to be his holy people, together with all those everywhere who call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. In the face of their sin and flaws, Paul calls them holy people, saints. We're all sinful, but as followers of Jesus, we're saints. And like the Old Testament heroes we'll be studying this summer, you and I are sinners and saints. Now, I don't know that I'll go into that great of detail or others who preach will every week, but I want you to keep that as a backdrop for all of the men and women we look at over the next 12 weeks. The first character we're exploring in this series is a man widely regarded as one of the most righteous and upstanding people in all of Scripture. After his story is told in the first chapter of the Bible, he's mentioned multiple times in the Old and New Testaments. The prophet Ezekiel lists him along with Daniel and Job as one of three men who, despite their own righteousness, couldn't save the unfaithful people of Jerusalem, even if they were to return from the dead and preach to them. In the New Testament, the apostle Peter calls this man a preacher of righteousness, whom God protected from an ungodly world. The person I'm referring to is Noah, the man who believed God and in faith constructed the ark to save himself and his family from God's judgment against a sinful world. Noah's listed in chapter 11, the Bible's hall of faith, uh, Hebrews 11, the Bible's hall of faith as part of the great cloud of witnesses who cheer us on as we run our journey of faith. Noah's righteousness and his faith is legendary, and yet the last, count, the last account we read of Noah in Genesis sounds like something from a tabloid TV show. Noah, a man of the soil, proceeded to plant a vineyard. When he drank some of its wine, he became drunk and lay uncovered inside his tent. Ham, the father of Canaan, saw his father naked and told his two brothers outside. But Shem and Japheth took a garment and laid it across their shoulders they walked in backward and covered their father's naked body. Their faces were turned the other way so they would not see their father naked. When Noah awoke from his wine and finally fa- and found out what his youngest son had done to him, he said, Cursed be Canaan, the lowest of slaves, he will be to his brothers. So why am I sharing that with you? That kind of sordid detail of Noah's life. Well, following Noah, God's deliverance of Noah and his family from the great flood... Noah got drunk, and in his drunken state, he passed out and lay naked, where his son Ham found him. Ham apparently gossiped about his dad being drunk and indisposed and brought a curse on himself and his descendants. So why share that? Well, my goal in sharing that detail at the end of Noah's life, as well as other negative aspects of Bible heroes as we walk through this series, isn't to tarnish their reputations. Now, I understand that tarnishing people's reputations is kind of a, a hobby in our culture. And, and our media, and even we participate in that, are, seem happy to throw dirt on people that are prominent and in places of leadership. But that's not my purpose in sharing that. It's to emphasize that they were human like us. And in spite of their humanness, in spite of their shortcomings, God used them and called them righteous. To paraphrase Tyler Statton again, calling someone a saint isn't calling them good. It's identifying them as someone who has experienced the goodness of God. And we just sang about that in the song. Thank God for his goodness that has walked with us through all of our lives. I want to take a deeper dive into Noah's life now and see why he's held up as a model of faith and righteousness and how God used him to save the world. Genesis chapter 6, 5 through 8, uh, paint a picture for us of what was happening in um, Noah's life in, in the world at that time. We read these words. The Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on the earth, 
and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. The Lord regretted that he had made human beings on the earth, and his heart was deeply troubled. So the Lord said, I will wipe from the face of the earth the human race I have created, and with them the animals, the birds, and the creatures that move along the ground, for I regret that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Those words, but Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord, tell us a lot about Noah, but I believe they tell us even more about God. A question I always try to keep in mind as I preach from the Old Testament is, how does the sermon that I'm preaching, or how does the story or the verses that we're reading point to the life of Jesus? Even though Jesus isn't specifically mentioned, I believe that all of Scripture points to him. So even as we read passages from the Old Testament, that's an appropriate question. How does this passage, how does this story, how do these verses point to the coming of the life of Jesus Christ? All the scriptures portray God's amazing heart of love and compassion for his people, but this is especially obvious in the first 12 chapters of Genesis, where God repeatedly gives a fresh start to the human race. In Genesis chapters 1 through 3, we read about God creating the world and Adam and Eve, and then the fall occurs. In chapter 6, we read that God re regretted creating humans because the earth was corrupt and full of violence, so he started fresh with Noah. Chapter 11 tells us about people seeking to become God and collaborating to build the Tower of Babel that they said will reach to the heavens and make a name for themselves. So God scattered them across the earth with different languages. In Genesis chapter 12, we're introduced to Abraham and Sarah, who, by the way, we'll be looking at next week, through whom God determined to bless not only their descendants, but the whole world. And so throughout the storyline of the Old Testament, and particularly in these first 12 chapters, we see God trying, starting anew, starting afresh, to create the human race through whom he can show his love and develop people who are in relationship with him. Now, admittedly, the storyline of the Old Testament can be discouraging as we read misstep after misstep by God's people. But through it all, God had a plan. Amidst the repeated failures of the Jewish patriarchs, prophets, priests, kings, and ordinary people, God highlighted our inability to walk free from sin. He highlighted our inability to walk free from sin, and that's an inability that you and I continue to face, right? Right? There was a couple of you. The others of you have figured it out, huh? Okay. We need to talk afterwards. Either you need some help understanding better, or I need to learn from you. God highlighted our inability to walk free from sin. Eventually, he sent his son Jesus as the only remedy for human sin and the cure for the physical and spiritual death that accompanied sin. As we unpack Noah's story, I want to encourage you to keep in mind God's reaching heart of love that is evident in him saving Noah and his family in the face of a worldwide flood that destroyed the rest of humanity. God's preservation of Noah and his family foreshadowed the salvation he ultimately made available to every one of us through his son Jesus. I want you to follow along as I read Noah's story from Genesis chapter 6, verses 9 through 22. This is the account of Noah and his family. Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time, and he walked faithfully with God. Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight and was full of violence. God saw how corrupt the earth had become, for all the people on earth had corrupted their ways. So God said to Noah, I'm going to put an end to all people. For the earth is filled with violence because of them. I am surely going to destroy both them and the earth. So make yourself an ark of cypress wood. Make rooms in it and coat it with pitch inside and out. This is how you are to build it. The ark is to be 300 cubits long, 50 cubits wide, 30 cubits high. Make a roof for it, leaving below the roof an opening, one cubit high all around. Put a door on the side of the ark and make lower, middle, and upper decks. I'm going to bring floodwaters on the earth to destroy all life under the heavens. Every creature, that has, every creature that has the breath of life in it, everything on earth will perish, but I will establish my covenant with you and you will enter the ark." 
you and your sons and your wife and your sons' wives with you. You are to bring into the ark two of all living creatures, male and female, to keep them alive with you. Two of every kind of bird, of every kind of animal, and of every creature that moves along the ground will come to you to be kept alive. You are to make every kind of food that is to be eaten and store it away as food for you and for them. Noah did everything just as God had commanded him. These verses give us the basic facts that God shared with Noah about the destruction of the earth and about the ark that God asked Noah to construct so that he and his family could be saved. And in chapters 7, 8, and 9, we read more details of Noah's story. Animals boarding the arks in pairs, the onset of the flood, the flood lasting for 40 days, the earth being covered for 150 days, Noah sending out a raven and then a dove to determine when it was safe for him and his family to leave the ark, God's charge to Noah's family to repopulate the earth, and the rainbow God placed in the sky as a sign of his covenant promise to Noah and all humans that he would never again destroy the earth. I just summed up for you three chapters there, and I know I did that pretty quickly, but we don't have time to to read all of that. The biblical account of Noah provides us with an overview of what took place. The world was filled with evil. God determined to destroy humanity. Noah and his family were preserved by God as a remnant through the flood, and the earth began to be repopulated after the flood. But we're not really given many of the human interest details. Specifically, we're not given much information about the faith Noah placed in God that enabled him to follow through on building the ark and the persecution he likely encountered from his peers over the course of what probably was 75 years or so to build the ark. I wish we had more of these details, because it's often the details, I think, that are a connection point for us to be able to connect with them as humans instead of kind of elevating them as saints that we don't really have a lot of details about. There are many movies and books that attempt to fill in these gaps for us. But while there is probably truth in what they portray, they are all conjecture. As I was preparing the sermon on Noah, I watched the sight and sound musical version. Have any of you seen it? Any of you seen it in person or seen videos of it? We do have a copy in the library. It's not currently in the library. It's currently in my office. Actually, it's currently probably up there in the booth because we're going to watch a clip in a minute. But it's a very interesting portrayal of what may have taken place and kind of fills in some of the details around it. Really adds some texture to the biblical stories by filling in the details we're not given. As I watched the sight and sound musical Noah, I was struck by the amazing faith it took for Noah to follow through in God's command to build the ark, and by the resilience he showed in withstanding ridicule and probably persecution of his neighbors who resisted Noah's pleas to repent and turn to God and who stood in the way of him constructing the ark. Think for a moment about Noah's faith. Following God's interaction with Adam and Eve and their sons in the Garden of Eden, Noah is the first biblical character that we have record of God speaking to. What kind of faith did it take for God to recognize, or for Noah to recognize God's voice and to respond in obedience? What did it require for him to withstand ridicule and questioning from his neighbors to pursue what God had told him to do? I'm also intrigued by Noah's steadfastness in obeying God in spite of everything that could have led him to embrace doubt and unbelief. Think about some of the questions that would have been difficult for Noah to really have an answer to when God told him to build an ark. Who was this God who spoke to Noah? What was a flood? Noah would have had a conception of water, but pouring down out of the sky and welling up for the ground at such, to such a degree that it covered the earth? How about the massive size of the ark? You have the cubits there, unless you can easily interpret that, which I couldn't. That's 450 feet long, um, I think 45 or so feet high, three decks. That's a huge vessel. 
Noah persevered for as long as 75 years in constructing that ark. The people around Noah no doubt believed that he was mentally imbalanced. I mean, they were living in a desert, right? And this guy says, I'm building a boat, if they even knew what that was, so that when a flood comes that's going to destroy you all, my family will be able to live through it. Imagine how that went over. Noah was in essence, by building the ark, declaring judgment on his neighbors. You're all going to be destroyed, but my family and I are going to live, and we're the only ones left unless you agree to come on board with us, believing that God's going to destroy the earth. With each character in this series, my goal is to have us reflect on our own lives and consider what truths we can learn and apply to ourselves as we seek to faithfully follow Jesus. There are numerous unanswered questions we'll always have about Noah, but those don't keep us those don't keep us from making connections to our own lives. First, I want us to think broadly about our focus in this sermon series on sinners and saints. It's a widely accepted principle that each of us live into the picture we have of ourselves. Our identity, how we view ourselves, shapes us profoundly. And so my first question for each of us is this, do we view ourselves as sinners or saints? Is our primary image that we have of ourselves one of being sinners or saints? The Bible is clear that all of us have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. Being human equals being sinners. But the Bible is equally clear that because of Jesus' death for us, we can walk in freedom for sin, from sin and have new life. Sin and death no longer need to enslave us or define us. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, we read these words. If anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone, the new is here. The issue for us of whether we view ourselves as a sinner or saint is critical for each of us. We're human. We sin. We mess up. We fall short. But when we place our faith in Jesus and receive his forgiveness, we're saints. We're set apart for God as holy people. Whether we view ourselves as a sinner or a saint can make all the difference in the world. Secondly, I want us to focus this morning on God's reaching heart of love for each of us. When God was heartbroken by the sin and evil he saw in the world, he took note of Noah. Genesis 6 8 tells us, But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. It's easy for us to go through life believing we're unnoticed by God, that nothing we do matters all that much. But the truth is that God loves us, he sees us, and he's extremely concerned about what we do with our lives, not only for the impact it has on us, but for the impact it has on others. From the first pages of the Bible, God's plan in filling the earth with his glory and in drawing people into relationship with him has been that his people, people like you and me, would live our lives for him and in so doing, point others to his love. 2 Chronicles 16.9 explains it this way, For the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. Noah lived a righteous life and God took notice. He set Noah and his family apart as the ones through whom he would save the world in the face of a destructive flood. God also sees us. He sees you and he sees me. What we do matters because God's primary plan in drawing people to himself is that they would encounter him, that they would experience his love through us as we live our lives. The eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully devoted to him. Finally, I'd like you to reflect on these two related questions. What does it look like for me to be a person who places my faith unwaveringly in God and follows his direction? Noah did that and probably endured a lot of persecution. He probably did that in the midst of a lot of his own doubts and uncertainties and wanting to have a lot of the details filled in. But he followed God in faith unwaveringly. And the follow-up question, 
Is there an area of my life, of your life, where God is calling me to trust in him and live by faith? Where maybe what he's calling me to doesn't really match what I see going on around me. Doesn't match my human response of how I would normally respond or maybe even how loved ones or neighbors or people around us are telling us to respond. And yet, God's calling us to trust in him and live by faith. Noah was a man of faith. He lived in obedience to God's direction even when it was extremely costly. So how's your faith? How's my faith in God? And specifically, is there an area of our lives where God is calling us to trust him and follow him by embracing faith. Let's pray together. Lord, I thank you for the example of Noah and for the many other examples that we find in the pages of Scripture. We thank you for Noah's faith in you, for the trust that he placed in you and the obedience that marked his life, even amidst the doubts and concerns and uncertainties that he had. God, our lives are very different, and what you're calling us to probably looks very different. And yet, Lord, you call us to be people of faith. You call us to walk obediently with you, even when what you're telling us may not make sense, even though it may run counter to advice we're receiving receiving from other people. God, I pray that we would tune into your heart, that we would recognize that what you call us to, you call us to out of love for us, and out of a desire to see our lives make a difference in the lives of others. And so God, I pray that you would speak to each of us today. Speak to us through the example of your servant Moses. Noah, I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.